Today's scripture reading will be taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 13, and we'll be reading the first eight verses. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, that is on page 12. Genesis 13, 1 through 8. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwell in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Thank you, Brother John, and thank each of you for being here this morning. I appreciate Brother Baker and his uh, song selection. Uh, very appropriate to our discussion and our, our study this morning. And, and quite honestly, about everything that seems to be going on all around us everywhere. You can't uh, turn on the TV or, or look at any type of, uh, of a newspaper or anything reporting the news which I, without... Uh, being made very, very aware of all the anger and strife that is going on in, throughout our world. And of course, anger and strife is not something new. Uh, as we read, as Brother John read from Genesis chapter 13, that sometimes even among our own family members, situations arise that are difficult. Strife arises, anger, problems, disagreements, trouble. And it is at that time that Abraham, in his wisdom and in this situation, just very, very simply says, we need to remember that we are brethren. No matter what is transpiring, no matter what is happening, no matter how intense our disagreement might be, no matter how passionately we might feel about something, at the end of the day, we're brethren. And brethren figure out a way to resolve the issues. Sometimes... Even among Christians, and even among good friends, maybe co-workers that are Christians, we find ourselves in disagreements and disputes and strife. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, we are reminded of two men who had traveled together. One of the men had been a mentor to the other. They had worked together. They had suffered together, if you will. And I would suggest that the Bible seems to indicate with all of the time that they spent together that they had a close relationship in Christ Jesus. But then problems arise. Acts chapter 15, start reading with me at verse 30. And so when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. Now again, to give you context very quickly, they have left the uh, council in Jerusalem where the issue of uh, circumcision had been discussed. 
And the apostles and the elders had issued a letter to, to go to all the churches. Well, they're taking this letter now out so that, because there's no scriptures. They can't say turn to, you know, John chapter, no, or, or 1 Corinthians, no, because those things are not in, in existence. But this letter, they are going to take this out to the churches as a means of instruction. And when they had, heard, when they had read it, verse 31, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. And Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take John Mark with them. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Look at verse 39. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Two good friends, companions, co-workers, gospel preachers. And they have an issue that really to, to us and our observation would have been a non-issue. Whether John Mark went or did not go. But their uh, views of whether or not he should go were so intense that they could not continue and did not continue working together. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is addressing the Christians who lived in Corinth. And there are issues that are coming up between the Christians. But it wasn't doctrinal matters. It had to do with things that were going on in their lives. And here's what Paul says to these Christians who are fussing and fighting and literally taking each other to court. And we're now talking about the courts of the city. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning the things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already an utter failure 
for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Brethren against brethren. Christians, why do you take your problems before unbelievers to the law? Why do you let these small, insignificant matters bring shame upon yourselves, upon the Lord's church, and upon Jesus? Why would you do that? Do you not realize that you are brethren? And brethren have a special responsibility to other brethren. It really is that simple. But how many friendships, how many congregations of the Lord's church. How many Christian relationships have been destroyed simply because we forgot that we were brethren? We forgot that we were fellow workers in Christ. And what concerns me today is that all of the nonsense and foolishness that's going on in our world will somehow influence us in the Lord's church. And brethren, we cannot allow that. We are brethren. I do feel strongly about things in the world. I, I have strong opinions. But at the end of the day, we are brethren, and it does not matter. Not unless I allow it to. That's what had happened at Corinth. They had let something that didn't matter, some worldly nothing, put their souls in danger. We cannot allow that. I have long believed, brethren, that we have allowed everything to turn backwards because rather than the Lord's church and Christians influencing the world what we have going on is the world influencing the Lord's church and Christians and we cannot allow that because we are brethren so I want us to from the scriptures I want us to come up with what the Bible says that we do when it comes to brethren and how we treat brethren. And we're going to go back and look and see how each of these situations were resolved among the brethren. First and foremost, if I have an issue with a brother or within the brethren. I should remember I have a responsibility to be reasonable. How much that's going on in our world today could be solved if you could just get people to be reasonable. Come now, the prophet writes, Come now, let us reason together. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. If we could do anything to change all of the anger and the strife and the turmoil, it would be just to get people to be reasonable. Listen. How successful are we when we get into shouting matches with people? Does anybody listen to anything? 
I'm not making this up. A congregation that I worked with many years ago, the elders made a decision that some of the men of the congregation didn't like. And literally, after services, one of the men trapped an elder and had backed him kind of up against the wall and was yelling at him as loud as a human being could yell. Can you believe that happened in the Lord's church? Can you believe that happened between brethren? Do you think for one second that that individual was treating that elder like a brother? No. Some of the most unkind things I have experienced, some of the most unkind things that have ever been said to me as a person have been said by brethren. Because we couldn't be reasonable. We couldn't be calm. We couldn't just sit down and figure out a solution. If we're going to deal with each other as Christians, we're going to have to be willing to be reasonable. Number two, if I'm going to get along well with my brethren, I'm going to have to be willing to be straightforward, honest, and forgiving. And you say, well, why, what do you mean by straightforward? You remember in Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus talked about uh, a conflict between brethren? And he told his disciples, he said, you know, if your brother sins against you, you go to him and tell him his fault. That is probably one of the least observed scriptures in the Bible because if I've got a problem with somebody nine times out of ten I will tell it to anybody and everybody other than the person that I have a fault with in fact too many times I am more concerned with winning maybe humiliating maybe putting them in their place, that not only am I not reasonable, I'm not being very straightforward, I'm certainly not being very honest, and I am not approaching that individual with a forgiving attitude, with a desire to resolve and to forgive. Jesus said that's not the way it happens. You go to that person with them alone, you don't back him up against the wall and start yelling so everybody in the entire congregation and in five blocks around the building can hear your complaint and what you have to say. Rather than how many times do we see on television people standing each other and they're just yelling back and forth just as fast as they can yell at each other. Christians aren't that. We're brethren. We, we don't do that. We don't act that way. We go to Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, and we follow that specifically. We do what Jesus told us to do when it comes to dealing with brethren. And most of all, we forgive him. When the brother asks for forgiveness, we are anxious to do it. If he comes to us seven times in one day and says, please forgive me, how many times do I forgive him? Seven times. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. That forgiving, ready to embrace that brother, that sister, that's the way Christians approach things. Even, and listen, even a brother or sister that is no longer faithful you know the Bible specifically tells us to admonish that brother or sister because they're not being obedient. 
But do not count that person as an enemy. He says, you remember, you are admonishing a brother. Second, Th- Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. We are brethren. Even when we have to do unpleasant things, we do it honestly, straightforward, and with a forgiving attitude. Number three. This is my hardest one, but we see it over and over in Bible examples. And that is, because we are brethren, sometimes I have to accept being done wrong. I have to accept being cheated. I have to be willing to accept that I don't always get my way. And be willing to let that transpire with a smile on my face and a song in my heart. Most difficult thing, I don't know that I'll ever get good at it. I try to do the best I can. Because I believe in fairness, and if I don't think something's fair, it just drives me crazy. I I just, it always be a struggle. I want the right thing to happen, and I want it, and that's just the way I think it ought to be. So for me to think that somebody's going to get away with something, it just, it's almost more than I can stand. If y'all ever see me walk around just going like that, then somebody's gotten away with something, and it's killing me. Because I want to make it right. But see, that's what Paul told those Corinthian Christians. You guys just accept that you're going to be cheated, that that it's not going to be right, but you accept that. Because it's not worth your soul. It's not worth allowing your pride, your pride, from keeping peace and harmony among the brethren. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not allow yourself to humble yourself before somebody else? I'm working hard on that. Y'all pray for me that I'll get better at it. I've only been working on it 66 years, so I, I think I'll get it eventually in another 66 years. But Christians do that. Brethren do that. Number four. Be willing to compromise. And not only be willing to compromise, but be willing to let the other person benefit more than you. Do you remember back with Abraham and Lot? Now you remember in the patriarchal society, Abraham should have received the best because he was the elder. But he deferred to Lot and let Lot pick the best land. That's what brethren do. Brethren get joy and satisfaction out of seeing their brothers and sisters do well and receive well. Brethren, there are just too many of us that are unwilling to compromise. At the end of the day, we know through further New Testament teaching that Paul and Barnabas continued to be brethren and continued to have a relationship. Their compromise was we can't Go on this journey together. But they didn't walk away from that compromise saying that rascal Barnabas, that Paul, you can't talk to that hard-headed. No. I want, go back later and read. 
their compromise, their solution that they worked out glorified God because they both went out in separate areas teaching and preaching and strengthening people. See, when we are reasonable, when we are honest and straightforward, when we're willing to not get our way, and we're willing to compromise, God's work continues to be done. And God truly is glorified. Because notice that people are looking and people are watching. How we react. How we handle conflict. No matter what, in our quest to work with brethren, we must never, ever forget. I don't care what the situation is. I don't care what the issue is. It is not worth losing souls. And that's exactly what the Bible tells us. When we remember that we are brethren, we do things with the other's soul in mind. We're going to conclude our study this morning with two particular texts. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I want you to uh, start with me at verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 8. You know, they're arguing here. There's contention in the church over the eating of uh, the meat that had been sacrificed to idols. That's the issue, okay? But food does not commend us to God, Paul writes. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 8. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Now look at verse 12. But when you thus sin against the brethren, it's sin. And we're sinning against brothers and sisters in Christ. And you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. How serious is this? That sounds pretty serious to me. That sounds like people are going to lose their souls over this. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Is that not compromise? Is that not deferring to somebody else? Is that not saying I'm not going to do something that doesn't matter to cause you to lose your soul and ultimately need to lose my soul? Go to Romans 14. Here's where we ended. Because again, this was brotherhood wide, these issues. Romans chapter 14. Starting at verse 3. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another person esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. 
He who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. Now go down to verse 13. We're still in Romans chapter 14. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause a fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. And finally down at verse 19 and we'll finish. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Could, could God be any clearer? Could God be any more straightforward? Could we not take these biblical texts and literally change the world? I believe we could. And brethren, I believe that we as Christians rather than focus on all the things that, that Satan is using to try to divide us, that we should rather focus on the beautiful things in Christ Jesus that unite us. We are brethren. We are bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Let us, let the world know what it means to be brethren. Brother Jerry has selected a song to encourage those in our assembly who may have a need of a spiritual nature this, this morning where they would like to come before this assembly and let that spiritual need be known. If you're not a child of God, perhaps this is the day that you will stand before this assembly having repented of your sins and confess your faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son, as the Messiah, be immersed in water for the mission of your sins and the blood of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed on Calvary's cross will wash away your sins and God will add you to the church this very day, this very hour. We may have Christians who have struggled, who have forgotten who their brethren are, who have in some way done something offensive. Perhaps it requires us to go to that brother or that sister and ask for our forgiveness and ask that they be willing to accept us in our failure and to forgive us likewise. Perhaps I just need the prayers of the church for strength, for encouragement, Perhaps you're visiting with us and, and you just want this congregation, these elders, to pray with you and for you, for, for your spiritual life, for your search, for your journey, for the truth. If you're subject in any way, won't you come as we stand together and as we sing?